Hello everyone, welcome to The Biggest Ideas in the Universe. Today we're doing the Q&A video associated with idea number six, which is space-time. We actually have a lot of good, very basic questions, things that I honestly could have covered in the original video, so let's just dive right in to them. Uh, one question is, is time, this maybe is uh, more appropriate for the time video than for the space-time video, but still, is time possible without change? This is a, a very common question. So I understand where this question comes from, but I think that the answer is pretty basically yes. Yes, it is. Here's where the question comes from. Imagine that you were in a universe where nothing changed, literally nothing happened, right? You could have stuff, you could have an arrangement of matter in the universe, but that stuff was exactly in the same configuration, doing exactly the same thing, namely nothing, at every moment of time. In that case, the entire idea of a time dimension is completely beside the point, right? It doesn't actually represent anything. If there's nothing different from moment to moment in time, then in some sense, time doesn't play any role, and therefore, can we just say time doesn't exist? But I think that's a little bit going too strong. I mean, after all, the whole point of the space-time video was that time is kind of like space. So imagine, you know, there's a planet with a person on it, and another planet, planet A, planet B, another person on it. And that's a terrible little person. I can do better than that. Come on. And the point is that there's space in between them, right? There's the vacuum of empty space. There's nothing going on in between them. But nobody would be tempted to say there's no space in between them, right? Space we think of pretty naturally as having an independent existence. This was a controversial topic back in ancient times, right? Whether or not the vacuum could really exist or not. But certainly in our post-Einsteinian world or even our post-Newtonian world, space exists. It's out there, even if there's nothing happening. I would say the same thing is true about time. Even if there's nothing there, even if there is nothing uh, actually changing with time, you should still say that time exists because time is kind of like space. Time is part of the four-dimensional manifold where things happen. You shouldn't privilege your being able to notice something happening just uh, in order to say that something exists. Space-time is something that is a fundamental ingredient in relativity. You know, we take it as existing in addition to the role it plays. We can imagine and we often talk in theoretical physics about space-times with nothing in them right? Completely empty space-times, but both space and time exist then. And in fact, space and time can have properties even when nothing exists, like the curvature of space-time. We've been talking about special relativity, which is an example of space-time with zero curvature, but in general relativity you can have space-times that are still static and have nothing in them that are vacuum, but are not flat, and they are still existing in some very real sense. So I don't like to confuse time with change. It's true that in this fake universe where literally nothing ever happened, time would not be important. It wouldn't play a role. But nevertheless, it could exist. It's a real thing. In, in the, from the relativity point of view, space and time are both real things, both part of a real thing, which is four-dimensional space-time. Okay, so that's something that was pretty easy, but it's a, it's a common thing, so I thought we should get rid of it. Um, the next one is a little bit trickier, but it also is something that just comes up over and over and over again. So let's dive into it. Photons, do they really experience no time? This is a question. And what does it mean if you say that a photon experiences no time and so forth? Um, and this is, this is a tricky one because I think that there's more than one possible confusion that is entering in here. So let's start by actually saying what is true, okay? What, what is actually real? So here is our space-time diagram, space, time, and we have a way of measuring intervals in space-time. So if you take our origin right here, and there's a light cone that we conventionally draw at 45 degrees, one of the questions that was asked was why 45 degrees? Well. What would you do, right? What else would you pick? You could draw whatever you want. You could have different coordinates where light cones could be at anything. 45 degrees is a very natural thing, given that the speed of light is the only invariant special speed in this particular way of doing things in a relativistic space-time. So then, given that, we can talk about different paths, different little segments of space-time connecting two different points. There's one little path. Let's draw another one. 
between here and here, let's say. And let's draw yet another one between here and here, let's say. And this is actually going to answer another question that, that's coming up later. Um, this yellow path, let's zoom in here. This yellow path is what we call time-like because it moves mostly in the time direction. This green path is what we call space-like for the same reason. It moves mostly in the space direction. And this orange path we call null for light-like for obvious reasons. And these are all imaginable paths through space-time. When I say path, I don't mean a path a particle can actually take. We posit in most theories of physics that no particles can move on space-like trajectories. If they could, they'd be called tachyons. A tachyon is a particle that is completely hypothetical in the sense that it probably doesn't exist. Tachyons are particles, let me say that would move on space-like trajectories. But they don't exist, so therefore they don't move on space-like trajectories. And we think that real particles either are light-like, massive particles, or null, massless particles. But regardless of whether, oops, trajectories, can I do this? Yeah, can I fit it there? Good. Regardless of whether a physical particle can move on one of these paths, we can still talk about the length of one of these paths. And as you noticed, we measured the length differently for time-like paths or for space-like paths because there's a minus sign that comes in, right? So for time-like paths, let me just erase this little note about tachyons because it's just an aside. It's not really crucial to what we're talking about here. Okay, uh, these three kinds of trajectories, you know, we want to measure how long they are and we use different ways of doing it. So for a time-like trajectory, the measure of how long it is is the time elapsed, the time that an actual clock moving on that trajectory would measure if it were a good clock. And so we say tau has the property that tau squared equals t squared minus x squared. If the, if the trajectory is curved, then we have to take the sort of tiny infinitesimal version of this, and then we integrate it using calculus, as we learned long ago. But this is the sort of finite straight line version. Uh, for a space-like curve, we don't want, there's no clock that can possibly move on it, right? But we can measure its length. So we talk about the length, let's say, L. We can call it L. And L squared is x squared minus t squared. Because the point is, you're defining something in terms of what it is squared, right? So you want to be able to take the absolute, the square root of it, and therefore you better ensure that the thing you're taking the square root of is a positive or at least non-zero number, right? Non-negative number. So you don't get an imaginary number. You don't want the time or the space to be an imaginary number. So that's okay. These are the definitions. You define the time elapsed to be the square root of t squared minus x squared. You define the spatial length to be the square root of x squared minus t squared. You get a positive number either way. But then what that implies is that for null or space or time-like trajectories, uh, x squared equals t squared. So x squared minus t squared equals zero. So therefore, whether or not you do it in terms of tau or L, you get the tau equals zero or L equals zero. The reason why I'm going through this uh, in the grisly detail here is because this is the fact. This is the truth, right? We're going to try to translate this mathematical fact into comprehensible English words. But this is the thing that is true and you should rely on it. If you're confused about what the English words mean, go back to this. This is the fact. There are trajectories in space-time, which we label as null or light-like. They are ones that we say are moving at the speed of light, and they have zero length in terms of space-time interval and zero time elapsed in terms of space-time interval. Okay, Those are the facts. Now, there's another fact, which is that photons move on such trajectories. And therefore, the space-time space interval along the path taken by a photon is zero. Again, that's a fact. That's a real good thing that you're allowed to say. Space-time interval along a photon trajectory is zero. Now, what you would like to do, what you're tempted to do, is to translate that into a statement that photons do not experience time. 
And I think that's a completely correct statement to make. Photons don't experience time, but let's be clear. Electrons don't experience time either in a very real sense. An electron moves on a time-like trajectory. It's a massive particle. It moves more slowly than the speed of light. But let's take seriously the word experience, okay? You and I can experience time because we are complicated, because things are happening in us. From moment to moment, as time changes, we change along with it. That's part of what it means to experience time in some very real way. An electron is exactly the same particle from moment to moment in time. It is not changing. Its mass is not changing. Its charge is not changing. It does not have any internal complexity that can keep track of the passage of time. So it's a little bit anthropomorphic to use a word like experience when you talk about what is happening to an electron. What you can say confidently is that there is a space-time interval associated with the path of the electron along which the time is a positive number. Okay, that's the thing you can say. You could also say if you took a clock and put it next to the electron, so you complicate the electron by making it a clock, that clock would tick a certain number of seconds or minutes or whatever, and that would be a positive number, and you can use this mathematics to measure what that, math what that positive number would be or to predict what it would be. You can't really take a clock and move it along with a photon. Because imagine what, what you're trying to do. For one thing, the clock would itself have to be a collection of photons. It can't be a clock that is a massive clock, otherwise it wouldn't be moving at the speed of light, right? And there, it's a true statement that if you just have a bunch of photons moving along next to another photon, there's no change that happens within those photons, uh, not from inside them, their individual selves. But from the point of view of someone outside who is not moving along with the photons, they can see change. The photons need not be completely oriented in the same direction as uh, each other. So they, they could be moving apart from each other or, move, or moving closer. Again, what you're tempted to then say is, OK, let's build a clock out of photons. Let's let them interact and tick back and forth. But guess what? As soon as those photons start interacting, they form a system that is no longer massless, that is no longer moving at the speed of light. You can't build a clock purely out of photons. You can almost do it by like putting photons in a box and watch them bounce back and forth, but guess what? The box is not moving at the speed of light, and the sides of the box are crucial to building that clock. So the point that I'm getting at here is that you're running up against our intuitive notion of experiencing time versus the actual reality of a photon moving all by itself through the universe. It's correct to say photons don't experience time, but then you want to like take that a little bit too seriously. And then you want to ask like, well, but a photon is a wave, right? Isn't a photon an electromagnetic wave? No electromagnetic waves go up and down. Well, a photon is not a wave. Light is a wave. A photon is the particle that you observe when you actually measure that electromagnetic wave very, very carefully. This is a feature not of special relativity, but of quantum mechanics, which we will get to. And of course, the electromagnetic wave goes up and down from our perspective. As it passes us by, we can imagine seeing it go up and down. But if you just follow along the crest of that wave, nothing is changing. No time is passing from that point of view. So I would just not worry too much about the internal life of a photon. That is my, that is my advice. You can either worry about that and wrap yourself in, in riddles and mysteries about what the photon sees and experiences, or you can stick to the things that are actually true in the math, namely that there are space-time intervals that we can calculate, and when you calculate them for a photon, you get zero. Everything hangs together there. Um, but there are related questions to this that make perfect sense. Uh, what about photon momentum? Because we define momentum, well, we didn't define it this way, but we said that in classical Newtonian mechanics, momentum was P equals M times V, right? Now V is the speed of light, but the mass of the photon is zero. So it, it seems like this might be zero. So maybe a photon can't have momentum. But that's not exactly right for two reasons. Number one, this is no longer the formula for momentum um, when you are in relativity, when you're in special relativity, okay? Remember, special relativity changes the rules a little bit of classical physics. It is still a version of classical physics, but it's a modified version. It's not Newtonian version. So I don't want to go into too many details, but for a massive particle, the correct formula is mv over 1 minus v squared over c squared. 
So you see that as v, the velocity, goes up near the speed of light, near c, 1 minus v squared over c squared comes very close to 1 minus 1, which is 0, and you're taking mv and dividing it by 0. So you take 0 divided by 0, if you have 0 mass and 0 in the denominator, and you get an undefined number. So this formula just doesn't apply to photons, to particles that have speed of light uh, motion and zero mass. But there is a formula that does work. So basically, let's just let's leave that there but cross it out. For a photon, it turns out that you can go back to the electromagnetic wave, right, that has a wavelength, and talk about the momentum in terms of that. And the answer is that it is h over lambda, where lambda is the wavelength of the associated electromagnetic wave. And h is Planck's constant, which is characteristic of quantum mechanics. Then you can translate this if you want something that looks more like the ordinary formula for momentum. This looks like h uh, divided by c, the speed of light, times the frequency. So a higher frequency of vibration for the electromagnetic wave corresponds to more energy, more momentum in the photon, okay? But this is, this is sort of weird because you somehow need to have quantum mechanics to talk about the momentum of a photon. Why is that when, after all, electromagnetism and special relativity are completely classical? Yes, but photons are not completely classical, right? Photons are particles that you get when you quantize the electromagnetic wave. So if you talk about electromagnetic waves, you can talk about a density of momentum, and there's a formula for that, but a wave is spread out all over the place. If you want to idealize it as a particle, you need to be thinking quantum mechanically, and H, Planck's constant, comes into the game. But you do get these very nice formulas. Okay. That was a much more down-to-earth question. Let's get crazy again. Uh, what about, could there be more than one dimension of time? This is always a, this is a favorite question. Let's just say, could there be two dimensions of time? After all, we say that uh, space-time is four-dimensional, meaning there are three dimensions of space and one of time. But we often talk about simple idealizations where there's only one dimension of space or two dimensions of space. And modern theoretical physics goes up to you know nine dimensions of space or just arbitrary numbers of dimensions of space that we could imagine. And we talk about that fairly straightforwardly. I talked about it uh, several uh, videos ago. So why don't we ever talk about multiple dimensions of time? Well, you know, whenever you ask questions like, could there be, the answer is usually it depends. It depends on what precious uh, ideas you're willing to keep and which ones you're willing to let go of. So when there are more than two dimensions of time, here is what happens. I, it's very hard. I've tried to figure out how to uh, actually plot this, how to draw this. And I did not succeed. But let me just draw, rather than drawing a space-time diagram, let me draw a time-time diagram, T1 and T2, okay? So let, we can imagine, let me, maybe, maybe I can do this. Let's see if this works. I can imagine space going perpendicularly to both of these, okay? So here's all of space, when all represented by x. And the point is, when you only have one dimension of time but multiple dimensions of space, then as long as you're moving slower than the speed of light, you are moving forward in time. You are forced to move forward in time. That's the implication of this light cone picture over here, right? Uh, someone said, could I draw the light cones as three-dimensional? But, you know, I think that it should be pretty obvious. At every point, there's a little light cone that looks like this, that it has a cone-shaped structure if we imagine promoting our x to x, y, and z, and so forth in the different numbers of dimensions. So that's the, that's the fact. If you want to go slower than the speed of light, and move, then you will move forward in time. There's only one direction to go in. But imagine starting, you know, at some time t1, but there's a whole nother dimension of time, and you have x, and you say, well, I move at a certain speed uh, in the t direction, but that's the combination of t1 and t2. I need to move at least as fast in t as I do in x. But I could easily just go in a circle in t. I don't need to move in x at all, right? That counts as moving in time without moving in space at all. I'm moving a lot more in time than in space, so that's a time-like trajectory, right? That would be an allowed trajectory. But this is what is called a closed time-like curve. 
this is uh, something that becomes interesting also just in the context of a single dimension of time, but when you have time machines and general relativity. So I mentioned wormholes some time back. This is the kind of thing that you'd be talking about in the technical literature. It's a little, um, uh, it seems a little fear-mongering or sensational to say time machine. So you say closed time-like curve. If there were more than one dimension of time, you could easily just go around in circles in time. You could meet yourself in the so-called past. Your personal clock ticking forward as you move is completely compatible with just doing the same thing over and over again in the universe. Uh, and that's generally thought to be bad. <laughs> you know, you can't go back and forth in space. I mean, sorry, you can, of course, do a circle in space, but you not meet yourself because you're forced to go forward in time. But if there were more than one dimension of time, you could just go in circles and meet yourself in the past. That is generally thought to be bad. This hasn't stopped people from completely thinking about it. There is a physicist at USC, University of Southern California, named Itzhak Bars, who very famously has explored the physics of theories with two dimensions of time. It's a whole thing, a whole program he has called Two Time Physics. And basically, he kind of cheats. He kind of does not allow for behavior like this. So he puts in two dimensions of time, then there's a restriction on what kind of motion you're allowed to do, so this kind of bad behavior doesn't really happen. So I think that physically, realistically, two dimensions of time or more are just a bad idea, but you're allowed to think about it. And honestly, you know, what do we know? Like You should be open-minded about these things. My bet is that there's only one dimension of time, but if someone comes up with a really brilliant version of physics or quantum gravity that involves more than one dimension, I'm certainly willing to take it seriously. Okay, here's another question that we got, which uh, is a fun one. This another one. This is, again, a more down-to-earth question. How do you add velocities in special relativity? So there's the famous idea that, you know, you're on a train or a car or something, here you are, and your train is moving at some speed v1. And here you are on the train, and you throw a ball at a velocity which, to your perspective, that is, from the rest frame of the train, moves at velocity v2. And the whole point, a big, big deal in special relativity is you don't just add the velocities together in the usual way. So the Galileo way of doing it in Galilean relativity, you would say v total equals v1 plus v2. They just add together. But you know that in special relativity, this can't be the right answer because in particular, the speed of light is the same to everybody. So if, if you, rather than throwing a ball on the train, if you turn on a flashlight and point, put light moving in that direction, then V2 would be equal to the speed of light. But the total speed, the, the speed that you would be observing by someone that would be observed by someone outside the train, they look at this and see the total speed, V total, they would not take the speed of light and add it to V1 because that would give you a number bigger than the speed of light. And the whole point of special relativity is everyone gets the same answer for what the speed of light is. So you can go through, you know, there's a set of mathematical derivations you can go through and you can talk about the length contraction and the time dilation and everything, but I'm just gonna skip right to the answer. The uh, relativity way of doing it, this is kind of cute to see, is that you just replace this formula. There is another formula that you get. So the answer is that V total equals v1 plus v2 divided by 1 plus, let me get it right, v1 times v2 divided by c squared, the speed of light squared, okay? So think about this. Let v1 and v2 get closer and closer to the speed of light. Remember we talked about limits when we talked about calculus. Um, you don't want to just plug in v1 equals v2 equals the speed of light. You can in, the, in this particular case, but the more careful, rigorous way to think about it is to let them get closer and closer and, and see what happens. Then, from this formula, v total approaches c plus c divided by 1 plus c squared divided by c squared. Okay? This is math you can do. This is c plus c is 2 times c. c squared divided by c squared is 1. 1 plus 1 is 2. So this is divided by 2. So this equals c. 
okay? So in relativistic additions of velocities, when you take one velocity that is close to the speed of light and add it to another velocity close to the speed of light, the total velocity is still close to the speed of light. And the reason why is because the formula for adding velocities is a little bit different. Nothing crazy about that. I mean, it's a little bit crazy, but nothing, nothing hard to understand about that. Okay, the final question I want to talk about is, um, this is, this is a, another perennial question. Why is the speed of light 300 million meters per second? Several people thought that I made a mistake. <laughs> I said that 300 million meters per second is the speed of light. Um, I make mistakes all the time. I've made several mistakes in the earlier videos. When I make mistakes, I try to put errata up there in the, um, the show notes for the video on YouTube. I'm, I'm taught by YouTube experts that I shouldn't do that. What I should do is put a comment in the YouTube video and that the comment will rise to the top and people will see it. No one reads the show notes that I put up there. That's perfectly clear because people keep asking me, you know, where is the, what is the uh, background image? Where does it come from? That information is always up there in the show notes, but no one reads those. So um, yes, so this was not a mistake because I know why you think it's a mistake because you're used to seeing that the speed of light is 300,000 but you're used to seeing this 300,000 kilometers per second. So 300,000 kilometers per second is 300 million meters per second. I wanted to use meters per second because I wanted to use both meters and seconds as good human scale sizes because I wanted to draw the light cones in uh, units of meters and seconds just to illustrate how different it is. Anyway, the point is, why is it this number rather than some other number? So there's sort of two ways you could imagine answering this question. One way is you could just be obstinate and you could say, well, C is always equal to one. C is just equal to one light year per year. That's always true and, uh, or one light second per second or whatever units you want to use. These are the natural units that physicists tend to use where the speed of light is set equal to one and you don't worry about meters and seconds. But that rubs people the wrong way. You know, the, the ability that we have to choose units doesn't change the fact that in the units that we generally use, like meters and seconds, the speed of light has a certain value. But the point of this glib obstinate answer is that I'm allowed to turn the question on its head. The question you should be asking is not why is the speed of light 300 million meters per second? The, the speed of light is the speed of light. It is the fundamental speed limit in the universe. The question you should be asking is why do we use meters and seconds, right? Why do we use those units in our everyday lives? And the answer, which I already gave away, um, I actually also gave this answer in a recent uh, Ask Me Anything episode of the Mindscape podcast. So I'm going to repeat it here because it's also relevant here. Meters and seconds are very natural units to use for human scale things because people are a couple meters tall and when someone pokes you and you react, it takes you out a second to react, right? It takes you out a second to do something in the world. So if you think about the typical spatial scales and the typical temporal scales of the world, meters and second, seconds are very natural units to use, just like, you know, uh, feet and seconds would be. It doesn't really make much of a difference. So. The real, real question you want to know is why, in terms of ordinary human scale activities, does the speed of light seem so big? And why is it the specific big number that it is, 300,000 versus 200,000, etc.? So the reason why it seems big is because human beings are slow. <laughs> Sorry about that. I don't mean mentally slow, picking up new ideas, but we move slowly compared to the speed of light, right? We are massive objects at relatively low temperatures. We've settled down. Right? In the very early universe, uh, things were so hot that the atoms, the protons, the neutrons, the electrons were all zipping around very, very close to the speed of light. But the universe has cooled down since then. We've cooled down in a, in a very fortunate way for the existence of life. Life cannot really exist very comfortably in the mega hot plasma of the early universe. And so we are lumbering slow beings moving slowly compared to the speed of light. And therefore, it's very natural to us that the speed of light is big. Okay. But then you, you want to be a little bit more persnickety than this. You want to say, well, but why that specific number? Um, why, given the units that are natural to us, is it 300 million versus some other number? You know, and again, in some, here's the thing. Let, let, let's put it this way. 
when you whether or not you want to use meters and seconds or anything else when you're measuring the speed of light it is a velocity which means it's a distance divided by time which means we use something to measure it with right we use some standard measure of distance and some standard measure of time okay and so standard measures of distance come from atoms it's the basic laws of physics that set the scale for lengths in the universe there's a size that a typical hydrogen atom has you know the compton wavelength of the electron uh, the masses we'll learn when we get to quantum mechanics there's a relationship between the wavelength of a particle and its mass and so the mass which is a fundamental unit of nature fixes its wavelength and therefore that wavelength is a way that we can measure things the distances that we measure come from the fundamental parameters of nature. The same thing is true for time. You can imagine uh, an atom doing a certain transition from one energy level to another, and you can say things like, well, how frequently does that happen? That's a kind of crude but possible way to measure time. You can also say when that happens and an electromagnetic wave is released, if I know the wavelength of the light, then I can just measure the distance between the peaks and, and troughs of the actual wave and get a distance from that. So I can get either, if I know the distance, I can get the time. If I know the time, I can get the distance. But the point is that our fundamental units of measuring both space and time come from the fundamental laws of physics, by which I mean the masses and energies of the fundamental particles. Therefore, when we measure the speed of light, we do so secretly in terms of the sizes of atoms and the frequencies of light they emit and the rate at which different radioactive processes happen and stuff like that. We use the fundamental laws of physics to measure the speed of light in this particular way. So what a lot of people, I'm building up, you know, this, this sounds all kind of obvious, but I'm building up for the question, could C be different? Could it be different elsewhere in the universe? Or could it change over time, right? Could the speed of light have been different in the past or in the future? So there are theories where this is true. VSL, variable, you know, you can guess what this means, right? Variable speed of light theories. I'm not myself a big fan of these theories, so let me explain why. I really think, you know, when I make the glib joke that the speed of light is one, I'm not just joking. You can always choose units in which the speed of light is one. There's a very real sense in which to say the speed of light is changing is strictly nonsense, because I can always choose units in which the speed of light is one. It is the speed with respect to which I measure other things. But that's the point. The point is that I can imagine changing other things like the charges and masses of different elementary particles in exactly such a way that the only observable effect in the universe is that the way I measure the speed of light would be different. You know, from someone's point of view, the speed of light is changing the same, but the masses of protons and electrons and the electric charge and the strength of gravity and all that stuff, all that stuff is changing over time. The speed of light is constant from one person's point of view. From another person's point of view, in this kind of theory, all that other stuff is remaining constant, but the speed of light is changing. These are completely equivalent ways of talking. You can always trade off a purported change in the speed of light for a set of changes in other constants that exactly conspire to make it look like the speed of light is changing. So people have thought about these theories. Uh, Albrecht and, and uh, Magagio uh, famously wrote some papers about this stuff, and but it never really caught on. I think that's the reason why. The point is that if you just change perspective from you're changing the speed of light to you're changing every other constant of nature in just such a way that it conspires to make it look like the speed of light is changing, that seems a lot less compelling. The, the point is that when you really dig into what the speed of light is, you shouldn't think of it as something that is fixed in terms of meters and seconds. You should think of it as something that is cooked into the fabric of space-time itself. It defines what space-time is. Everything else is relative to the speed of light rather than the speed of light being relative to some absolute fixed thing. We don't have absolute fixed distances and times, but we do have an absolute fixed speed in the universe. And that's why I don't really like to think of the speed of light as changing, but you're allowed to. That's the short version of that. Okay, finally, finally, I'm not going to actually answer this, but there are many questions about curved space-time. <laughs>
So I did the video about space-time, and then secretly I just did it about special relativity, which is the particular idea that there is a flat space-time that is a background that is absolutely fixed and unchanging. Of course, over the course of 10 years, Einstein went from that point of view to general relativity, where he says that space-time has a life of its own. It can respond to energy and to matter, and we interpret that response as gravity. So a lot of people ask questions about black holes or the Big Bang or light cones in different kinds of space-times and stuff like that. I'm just indicating here that I'm not entirely blowing you off, but I want to talk about those questions in an entirely different video in different contexts. I'm going to, I'm going to give gravity and curve space time it's due, okay? That is a topic that deserves a video of its own. So for space-time itself, that's all I got to say. Space-time being flat is still a big enough idea that it qualifies as one of the biggest ideas in the universe.